So welcome everyone. It's time to tap into your personal power and pull up a cup for this episode of In the Empower Coffee Break. I'm Mary Brody with Empower Coaching and today our guest is Bettina Bennett of Witchbox Media and she's here to discuss her career path and how her career is a great example of the fluid career that we talk about a lot on the show. So um, if you're live on the video and want to join the conversation, then just leave us a note in the chat box and we'll bring you right in. So just so you know, we hold these coffee breaks live every Tuesday at noon Eastern to explore empower topics and strategies that can help you achieve the work-life satisfaction that you're looking for and how to lead in, an in, at, in a pro-human workplace. So join us live, watch and listen to past recordings at coffeebreak.inpowercoaching.com and subscribe to our podcast at, on iTunes at Empower Coffee Break. So we're going to start getting into it and I am going to introduce Bettina. Um, born in Germany, Bettina has been um, a change agent her entire career and a constant creator of firsts. So since founding her first venture, Media Rights Management, in 1988, Bettina has proven her business acumen over time as an innovative entrepreneur, an international entertainment consultant, a convergence maverick, a social media cross-platform marketing expert, and a visionary in the realm of media and content monetization. With a background in law and literature, Bettina began her career at one of Germany's most prominent publishing houses, creating the first media department at any European publishing company. When she launched her first company, Media Rights Management, it rapidly became the expert source for procuring funding for international entertainment projects, development of new content distribution and syndication models, and arrangement of the first ever entertainment, entertainment industry joint ventures between European and US companies. Hollywood Reporter, Variety, MIPCOM Magazine, and other media have described your projects as major, groundbreaking, the biggest and quintessential international co-production deals, and notable, and referred to Bettina as a new breed of international media projects coordinators and one of a kind. Foreseeing the developments in digital media and the social media space, Bettina then par parlayed her efforts into launching, launching Witchbox Media and developing Witchbox, a new technology platform with a focus on interactive multimedia storytelling, community, and content. With its patented technology, Witchbox is another first, the only all-in-one interactive storytelling platform that brings together social networking and community technology with user-generated content tools, community content management, and gamification. And Bettina was also honored by the Dallas Business Journal in 2014 as one of the top women in technology in North Texas. So welcome, Bettina. Glad that you can come on today. I'm sorry. It's such a mouthful. No, oh, that's cool. That's all good. <laughs> I clearly had a fluid career. So. It's quite exciting. My, that's why I my to have resume you on. kind of like reads like that fluid career already. So um, thank you very much for having me. And um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think um, it'd be great to start, like, to start with your background. I know um, I've heard the story before of, like, I know you started even, your career even starts earlier, like, when you were 15 doing fashion, right? Yeah, so. You run the um, gamut. <laughs> I, I guess, um, actually, uh, there is one story of my first failed entrepreneurial activity, and that is when I was six. I tried to sell my brother to a childless aunt and uncle that were very wealthy and didn't have children, and I thought it would be perfect because he would still live down the street, but I would have him out of my hair, and he would destroy my Lego constructions. Um, that did not work out. So, um, but um, afterwards, yeah, um, I, as you said, I grew up in Germany and I had very typical, somewhat conservative or half German parents. And I always wanted to wear what was cool and what was in. And my mom told me that my clothes had to survive as a hand-me-down to my younger sister. And so I made a deal with her and I said, well, what if I create my own clothes? And so I learned how to sew. I started designing and making my own clothes and it caught on with my classmates. And so was my first enterprise born. And I basically, you know, created my extra income during high school 
by designing and selling clothes to my classmates. That's awesome. I think that's so fantastic. Oh, it, it was a lot of fun um, because it is really great when at a small level like that, you actually understand things like demand and supply and what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, that you have to deliver on your promises. And, <laughs> you know, people were counting on me getting that new skirt or whatever exactly when I had promised it to them. <laughs> so it was a very early um, lesson in sort of not only entrepreneurship, but also responsibility in terms of what you promise and how you keep your promises. So now this is where it gets interesting because you were in fashion and then you go to being a lawyer. So what prompted the well actually law. what prompted that is that I had a secondary career aside from fashion while I went through high school and that was that I danced classic ballet from age four until 18 and I was in the local theater in the corps de ballet and I really wanted to do something that was creative so fashion was very much in line with that I worked as the assistant to the assistant to the assistant director at the local theater. I helped in their costume department and stage design department. And that was really what I had carved out for myself. And then my conservative parents stepped in and said, well, if you want to do something creative, that's fabulous, but not with our pocketbook. And so I had to figure out what I was going to do after I finished high school. I didn't feel that going to university was the right step for me. Um, so I decided to actually do a traditional apprenticeship in publishing and get my degree in publishing. And it was tied to my other passion, which to this day has been and are books. I am a ferocious reader. I love reading. If you'd lock me in a library and give me good food and coffee, I'd probably be happy. And so I decided that I needed to do something that I was truly passionate about that I thought was exciting. And so I did this and then I worked in the publishing industry for a number of years. And as I was watching what was happening in that space, I couldn't ignore how technology was impacting everything. And that's when I thought, okay, so the world is changing, the landscaping for, or the landscape of publishing is going to change. There is an incredible opportunity here. And that's when I decided to go to university and do my double masters in law and literature and specialize in entertainment and copyright law, because I thought that that was going to be the place where a lot of interesting things would happen. And so, now I kind of got through the back door back into the environment that I really wanted to be in, which was the creative and film and entertainment and television space. And while I went to university, one of my professors was um, an editor at one of the largest publishing companies in Europe. And he suggested that I should meet with their CEO because they would have the need for somebody who did what I did. I was one of the first people in, in Germany to specialize in that particular area. And I was the only one who had a background in publishing. So they invited me and they said, oh, we would love for you. And I had to work to, you know, pay for part of my way to the university. So job offers were always very welcome. And they basically told me, we want you to work with our legal and rights department to help them figure out how this is going to impact things. And being who I am, I told them that was way too boring. And that I didn't even know yet if I wanted to practice law, I just wanted to understand it. So I got lucky, their CEO was a very forward and independent thinker and he said, well then, go run around for two weeks and come back to me with a proposal on what you'd like to do that would get us also what we want. And I did that and I came back to him and I told him that I would love to start the first media department in a European publishing company. And the reason that made sense to me is that in Europe, in contrast to the US, 
authors that publish books give all the rights for motion pictures, television, all those kinds of things to the publisher. So the publisher is sitting on mountains of rights. And traditionally, they haven't done much to exploit those rights. And so I wanted to be the first one to help the rights and legal department figure out what do we own, but then go out and really sell those stories to film production companies, television companies, stage adaptations, um, audio books, you name it. And so that's how I really got into the realm of working in that environment, which was definitely a departure from what I originally did, but it helped that I had the background that I had. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so you go from, from there and then you ended up, I think, in the U.S. working at a Mark Cuban company, right? No, at, um, I worked at ICM. Okay. So, or with ICM. So when I did this for this publishing company, I ran into what a lot of women that are probably on this um, call today experience too. I ran into what I refer to as the concrete ceiling and not the glass ceiling. Okay. Um, it became so successful that the publishing company decided it needed to now be run by somebody who had a VP title. And I was young and I was female. And when I raised my hand and I said, well, I can be that VP, they just gave me a nice little pat on the head and said, yeah, think again. And so at that point in time, I decided that maybe my career as an employee of somebody else was over. And I started my first company called Media Rights Management, and it basically specialized in packaging international co-production and joint venture deals. And I was invited by ICM three months after I formed my company, who at the time, they represented people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Michelle Pfeiffer, Mel Gibson. So they were next to CIA, the big kahuna in that space. Um, they needed a partner to help them with their European ventures, to help their clients find you know, joint venture partners or capital. And so literally I launched my company in February. I had a call with them in March. I met with them in May at the Cannes Film Festival. And on June 1st, I also had an office on Wilshire Boulevard in LA. And that's really how I ended up, <laughs> how I ended up in the States um, and then worked in the entertainment industry for quite a number of years. That's awesome. That's really exciting. So, um, it's an interesting path because this also starts to bring up um, the fluid career and how you take little, almost like um, there, they can be almost like big leaps, but you're going along your path. And like when you reflect on it, it goes from leap to leap to leap, but it's almost like, it's almost like you have little steps that are there. Like, I don't know how you, you see the changes that you experienced. Yeah, so I think that it actually, looking back, it looks like I had planned it all just fabulously. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that that was not the case. Um, but I think there is a red thread. I thought about that sort of as I was kind of thinking about what we were going to talk about today. I think that when you think about this fluid career, and in my case, it led to, you know, not only a fluid career, but also to being an entrepreneur, that the red thread, the thing that connects it all is that everything I've done was connected to something that I was extremely passionate about. And I think that that kind of has to be your guide as you think about fluid career that it is connected to something that at a very personal and deep level is something that you feel strongly about. Um, and I think that the passion for that is what allows you to make those jumps because even if you don't have all the subject matter expertise, maybe at the time, that is stuff that you can acquire. What you can't get is the passion that drives you to get through that and it helps you to also get through the fear of starting something new because by no means was I not afraid. I mean, all of those were in yeah. some ways very radical changes. But when you're excited about something and you're passionate about something and you really love 
things that you do, then you can push through that fear. And it kind of helps you as your propellant to, you know, get into that new environment and sort of make it happen for yourself. Yeah. So, so we're going to take the passion and keep going with your career because we haven't made it to which box yet. So um, we'll go to the next leg of the, of the journey um, from media rights management to, to which box, right? Yeah. So that's, um, it, it really happened because of love, um, a different kind. I met my now husband of 20 some odd years in LA and he needed to be more centrally located in the US. And we kind of picked Dallas because of its airport. Um, I didn't know yet what impact that was going to have on my career. So I wanted to be at a big airport where I could get to the East Coast, West Coast, and back to Germany because my whole family still lives there with um, nonstop flights. And um, when we ended up in Dallas, I realized after some time that it was impossible to continue what I had been doing for a number of years because the entertainment industry, like many other industries, are those where networking is extremely important and you kind of have to be in the mix. You have to you know, bump into people. You just have to be on everybody's mind. They have to see you all the time. That's what drives new projects and business and consulting gigs. And I took a few years hiatus. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was kind of the woman behind the man for some time. I helped my husband start a number of businesses and be his support system. And then I decided that I really wanted to get back into what my roots were, which is the publishing industry. But I wanted to do it in a different way and I knew it had to be digital. And I was way ahead of my time because what I wanted to do was to create environments online where publishing wasn't something that was one directional, but where the audiences and the recipients sort of, of that content actually became active contributors and participants and where it was about a two-way straight and real dialogue and initially I wanted to just publish a magazine focused on environment and green and sustainability and then all my new friends in Texas told me that nobody was ever going to be interested in that green stuff and <laughs> Of course, in Texas, they would say that, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Tina, you know, nobody's ever going to be interested in that great stuff of yours. And, you know, with my not-so-good Texan, I would tell them that, you know, you all just watch and see when gas prices <laughs> get up, things are going to change. They told me that was never going to happen, but I was ultimately the one who was, um, you know, who had that right. But what I realized in the process as I wanted to build this environment was that there was no technology that was really built for dialogue. There, there weren't tools that would allow me not only to be a publisher, but in theory have an unlimited number of people come in through the door and say, and I'm going to also share and publish my story. So something that we now see in many environments like LinkedIn or a medium or whatever did not exist and it didn't exist as a tool that as a non-technologist, I could use to build my company on. And at the time I was introduced to my co-founder Jenny and the two of us then said, wait a second, if we have this problem, maybe other people have that problem too. We took a road trip, we talked to publishers and advertisers and marketers and they all told us kind of, well, if you build it, um, you know, we will come. And that's kind of, you know, in business, we call this pivoting. And in our personal careers, we call it fluid. And it really is. You know, it's kind of the same. It's kind of the same thing. You realize that a path that you're on may not quite lead you where you want to go. And for us, it was the realization that the world was going to change, that companies were going to have to find new ways to interact and engage with their customers or their audiences, and that what was existing 
was not going to really solve that problem. And so that's when we decided that rather than being publishers, we were going to build a platform that would, in our minds, brands always had to be publishers anyway, um, that would empower all types of different organizations to now create communities of common passion and interest. Um, and really allow them to build authentic and honest and transparent and real human to human connections with whoever their audience was. And so that's what I'm now doing. And how do you like what you're doing? I love it. I mean, if I didn't, I don't think I could go through all the stuff that you have to go through when you run a startup. Um, there are, you know, all kinds of challenges. Um, definitely connected with that and even within building the company we went through these what you would call fluid processes so when we launched Witchbox originally in 2008 we had raised some um, seed capital and a week after we launched the stock market crashed and that seed capital was really only there to build a prototype and now we knew this was going to be the only money for a very, very, very long time that we would be able to raise from anybody on the outside. So I talked to one of my mentors and said, well, how did you build your, you know, big company um, in similar times, which means the 2000 kind of crash and bubble. And he said, well, we did custom applications for customers that were willing to write us checks. And so that's what we did for some time. We needed to find a new way of creating income and capital to build our technology. And we did that for a number of years. It wasn't exactly on our path, but it got us to stay close to it because we could improve our technology. We could learn with real customers and we had somebody writing checks. And then in 2012, we got to a fork in the road where we had to make a decision. Do we want to be a bespoke development company or do we truly want to be software as a service, which always was our goal. And at that point in time, we divorced ourselves from every customer and from all the revenue that we had. Our developers were the only ones that got a paycheck for a year. And they took all the best pieces of what we had and turned it into a commercial piece of technology that we then launched in 2013. Um, and that's really when we started to be the company that we are now. And validation came since um, Fossil and its watch station brands were kind of our first customer right out of the gate. And that was really great. And it told us that the marketplace was slowly changing. We were still ahead of the curve, but it was changing and we were now on that path to being the company that we wanted to be. Yeah, because I think things are still changing. It's still early, um, even going to- Yes, we are. <laughs> you know, um, what is it? I was just um, in, a, in like a class session where they were saying like with social media, how most um, like the fortune, 50 fortune 100 companies still some of them like some get it right and some are doing an okay job with it they're like some of them don't get what engagement is like they, no, they it think it's customer and, surveys you know yeah, we have that yeah. conversation a lot or it means that they do influencer marketing which is just a fancy new word for product placement um and so so we see that but um you know, definitely, we're very excited because we think that with the technology that we've built, we can actually facilitate real change. And it may not be in all companies, but all companies are not our marketplace anyway. Right. Um, so we love to work with what we call enlightened brands that really not just talk about engagement, but actually mean it and really want their customers to fall in love with them and have like a real tight and and engaged relationship and connection now well one of the things you're bringing up um especially when it relates to fluid career is that you seem from hearing the patterns you were always like thinking one step ahead so how does that kind of like when you're seeing the future and you're making your decisions because i would think it's like kind of difficult to be ahead of where, because you're, you're ahead and you're looking back at everyone like, come on. Um, 
So yeah, how does that, how does that work? Um, it brings with it a great deal of frustration because it is frustrating when you're ahead and when you see things that to you are obvious and maybe to the rest of the world they're not. Um, I kind of, at least in the earlier parts of my career, got lucky because um, I, I tried to find people that kind of understood where I was going that were ahead of me in terms of what they had already reached in their career and they were older. And so I would find people that would be sort of my guides along the path until I got to the next stepping stone and then I'd kind of find myself another wizard, you know, that would point me in the right direction. But that's, I think, why it's so important that when you make these decisions, you don't make them because you're frustrated with the status quo, but I mean, that may be a driver to think about that change. But that's why I mentioned passion earlier, because that's really the fuel that you're kind of burning to get through there and stick with it um, and not get too frustrated in the process. And it also attracts people into your life and into your career that are sort of similar minded. Okay. You know, so when I think about the relationships and friendships I have developed, I mean, you know, you and I connected because of similar passions. And what you find is that you just create a different network of people right. that kind of have a similar or same point of view and their network is probably also going to be similar. So you start surrounding yourself with people that you can tap into when you try and make these moves that also understand that this is something that is authentic to you. And it's not just the different paycheck or the, you know, different benefits package, but it really is something that you do because you feel like you have to. So one of the things you mentioned, because you've been mentioning a lot too, is the people in the teams that you're working with. And how would you say the influence has been on your career with some of the people you've worked with? Well, I work with a very diverse group of people, so I kind of think that I always seek that out. Um, clearly, um, you know, I am somebody who doesn't like um, homogenous environments. I find them boring, and I don't think that they inspire you. Um, so I've always found that I like to be surrounded with people that are not always of the same opinion with me. I actually like working with and surrounding myself with people that have different cultural backgrounds, that um, have different business and educational backgrounds because you get all these perspectives. And when you have a problem to solve, you don't have the same solution from everybody because you have people that approach the scenario from very different vantage points. And that's kind of even how our team today looks like at Witchbox. It's a very, you know, diverse group of people. I mean, we're a bag of mixed nuts. Um, and that's, that's a very, very good thing because, you know, in the end, when you think about, um, what the name of our company is. I mean, the name of our company is Witch Box. And that kind of goes to the fluidity too. Um, we came up with the name because on my first trip to the US, when I first worked with ICM, their CEO introduced me to my new colleagues and said, oh, and we want to work with Bettina because she always thinks outside the box. And I looked at him and I said, Witch Box. Um, so in my mind, there never were boxes to think inside or outside of. I thought it was kind of silly that the one thing that has absolutely no limitations, which is thought, should be boxed in or boxed out. And 
So I think that if you have that fluid career, it's almost like you have to let go of this idea that there are certain boxes and that in the end, I mean, fluid doesn't live in boxes. No. It's a river, you know? And if there is something with hard edges, it will round it and it will, you know, grind it off. So somehow not believing that there is a box in the first place to me makes it something natural and not something I ever really kind of think about, both in my personal life as well as when it comes to the company. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's how you've gotten from where you were and where you are now is not necessarily limiting your thought by really letting yourself be creative. Yeah, and allowing, just allowing to observe things and to be open to conversations and different opinions and different viewpoints because you never know what you find in that. I mean, my favorite word is serendipity. And I think that in some regard, that's almost the guiding word through my kind of varied career because a lot of those things were serendipitous. Yes, that's, yeah. And, but in order for serendipity to occur, you kind of have to be available and you have to be open and you have to be receptive because otherwise it walks right past you and you don't even know that it was just there and you missed that. So... I think that's important if, you know, you decide you don't want to be 20 years or 30 years with the same company. And in many cases, that doesn't even happen just because the company doesn't keep people that long. But if you think that that is kind of how you want to live your life, then I think being open and sort of being in the moment and being available and showing up um, is really, really important. Well, yeah, and you also let go, too. You knew when to let go versus... You totally like, have to be able to let go. And it's hard. I mean, it's not easy because you've gotten attached to what you've accomplished and what you've achieved, and you kind of feel like you're almost starting from scratch again, and you have to build all of that back up. Um, and in the world that we live in now, you know, really, your past accomplishments don't really mean that much anymore, what most people care about is what can you do for me today? Um, And you have, yeah, you're absolutely right. So you have to be open and you have to be able to just let go. Well, now I know we're coming um, upon time. We started a little, we started a little late. Late. My my technical difficulties on my side here, (laughs) but um, what advice would you give listeners? um, If you had to give them a piece of advice Um, regarding the fluid career um, based on your experiences? So in, in, in connection with what I just say, so definitely be open. um, Be willing to um, to look at things that don't seem obvious Definitely be aware of what your own passions are. And when you think about making that move, make sure that you have the right intentions for that next step in your fluid career. Because it is never easy and there will be moments when, you know, you're gut is going to, you know, just tell you that this is way too dangerous and, you know, you're going to have moments of fear and you need to, you need to be in a place where you know this is the right next step. And that means it has to be connected to something where your own enthusiasm can carry you for some time until the world kind of catches up with that next step that you've just done and surround yourself with people that are going to applaud you when you do those kinds of things and not those that are constantly scaredy cats that are like oh my god you know how can you do that Uh, don't don't listen to that I think that the biggest mistakes in life are the things that you didn't try 
and um, there is nothing wrong, especially not in the world that we live in now, where you can determine so much of what people see when they look at you and what your own brand is. There is really nothing that should hold you back from trying something and even then finding out that that isn't what you're going to do. That's okay too. So that would be my advice. Okay, so there, before we go, there was one thing that you mentioned that um, was also being open to things that aren't so obvious. Um, I don't think we've really talked too much about that. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on that a little more, uh, maybe an example in your life of some, like, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, yeah, when I look at my own career, I mean, yeah. I don't have a technology degree. Um, it was, while well, I was interested in technology, I mean, I was like the first student at my university to write my master's degree on a computer. Everybody still had somebody who hired a typist and who was typing their stuff. And then, of course, my computer crashed three days before I had to deliver my thesis and I had to get an extension. And they told me that's what happened when you use technology. But, <laughs> oh um, my God, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> But so I was always curious about it, but I didn't see myself as somebody that would do something in that field. I always saw myself more as somebody who was, you know, creative and who was, you know, in some form of a consulting capacity because I love the idea of helping people or helping organizations figure stuff out. So that was not an expected step at all. It just was for me sort of like the logical conclusion when I thought, okay, so here's what I really want to do, which is I want to be a publisher. Heck, I can't find the technology. Maybe other people can find the technology. So maybe the next logical step for me is actually to build the technology. And that was extremely scary because I had to hire people like developers and pay for them out of my own pocket without being able to actually know if the work that they were delivering was good or not because I don't know how to write a single line of code to this day if my life depends on it. So um, that was probably one of my biggest leaps of faith, but I felt that I had done my homework in every other way in terms of is there a potential marketplace is there a need and do i really want to do it am i passionate about building this technology company and as i just chat with you you know i just a few days ago got my patent um so definitely not in the stars for me and now i'm one of a very small group of women that hold a software patent um so it's you know, that was unexpected. Everything that I've been doing for the last, you know, eight, nine years was something that if you look at my education, you would say is something I'm never going to do. You know, journalist, lawyer, publisher, all of those things would have been perfectly in line. But running a technology company, definitely not. Um, so I had to rely on, again, my own passion, and in that case, also that of my co-founder, who also doesn't come out of technology. So both of us are creative people. Um, and we both took that leap of faith together. And maybe sometimes that is something that you can do too, that you find somebody else, depending on what you're doing, that kind of yeah. wants to do the same thing so you can help each other out. And when one of you is, you know, scared out of um, your mind, the other one has hopefully an up moment and can help you over the cliff. And then you do the same thing when it's the other way around. That's really cool. Um, those are great pieces of advice for, I think, any of the listeners um, tuning in or on, on the podcast. Um, just even like absorbing it and thinking about it, um, you know, that whole being open, even like when you say with the not obvious, it's even like just even an interest can lead you down a path of your passion. Um, and you don't know that. Yeah, you know, until you try it. Until you try it. Yep. 
Wow. That's awesome. Well, I know we're at time. So Bettina, thank you so much for coming on today. This was great. Um, this was really good. This was an awesome conversation. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. This was fun. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad you, I'm glad you had fun. Cause um, yeah, I, these, these are usually fun, some fun um, conversations. It's always fun to get insights and in how people um, get, get to where they are in their career. And I think your career is like so fascinating because it goes from like, entrepreneurship, like this whole entrepreneurship um, with all these different stages. And now you're have a SaaS software company. So it's just, you know, publishing the software. It's like, <laughs> and lawyer in between. It's like, oh my God, that's such a path. It's so fantastic. So, um, so thanks again. And, um, oh, before we go, um, the URL of your company. Which box media? So W H I C H B O X M E D I A. With and, Fox Media. It, and if people have questions and want to get in touch with you, there is a little form and they can just put in their email and um, I'll get back to them. Sounds great. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning into this episode of the In Power Coffee Break. And please visit us at coffeebreak.inpowercoaching.com to see upcoming topics, past recordings, and learn how you can join us live. So have an empowered day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, thank you. Bye.